We're going to learn a pranayam, which is a yogic practice, and it's really effective in anxiety and depression. And kind of bring in a gentle focus and clarity to the mind. And I think um, this is a great practice to use every day. You can do it any time of day. It's not like some other pranayams where you need to have an empty stomach and <laughs> so I will demonstrate five times and then we'll do it together. Okay? I'm going to hold my index finger and these two fingers together and cover my eyes. And I'm going to use my thumb to hold this flap over my ear. And I'm going to gently rest my other two fingers on my face so that two of my senses are closed. And I'm going to inhale and exhale with a humming noise. can gently open your eyes and gaze at the floor in front of you. After doing that, interacting with the world right away can, can sometimes, I've had the experience of having a little bit of dizziness. I don't know if some of you have done it and had that, that experience also. Um, so you inhale as much as is comfortable and then you exhale with the hum. Make sure your spine is comfortably straight and you can fold up your legs if you wish or you can do it in the sitting position. This is pretty flexible. Are you ready? So two fingers together. Use your thumbs to cover your ears. Rest your lower fingers gently and inhale five times. the sound that they were making. 
and close our eyes to gauge the mood of the bees. And they would tell us whether or not it was an appropriate time to approach them. And sometimes we could sit very close, but we wouldn't be able to open the hive because they just wouldn't be in the mood. I don't wear a bee suit or anything, and neither is my teacher. We just kind of, we just go and be part of these bees. And this kind of falls into my Dharma teaching. Bees are a beautiful example of Dharma, that they're engaged in a passive Dharma. They're an animal. They have no choice as to whether or not they're going to participate in being a bee. They have to do their work. It makes it a very easy choice. And um, we are involved in active Dharma. Maybe that's a blessing. Maybe that's a curse. <laughs> we have to decide what is our Dharma. Are we going to do our dharma? Do I feel like doing my dharma today? Am I going to be a dharmic? And then this question arises as, as what is this word dharma? It is our duty. This is a very limited understanding of dharma. And I have to be very honest with you that I'm still learning about dharma and its deeper meanings. And so One of the things that the bees demonstrate is that they're very open about how they're feeling, what mood they're in, if you can approach their hive or not approach their hive. Many of us are holding the smile, but inside we are not really feeling very approachable, but we're kind of, <laughs> our actions and our inner thoughts are not aligned. And let's just say if we, if we held our, our needs more freely, and more openly, like the bees do, it would be much easier for others around us to know if it was appropriate to interact or approach us. Not that we're in a bad mood necessarily, but just like with my children, I can say to them, you know, I'm feeling a little irritated or antsy or something like that, and I'm gonna go sit in my room and I'm going to have, the, I'm gonna have some quiet time. And then it eliminates the interaction of Mom, I need your attention, and me being consumed with thought and feeling interrupted and then getting snappy. And uh, I think this happens with other people at work all the time. You know, you're trying to work on the computer, because we all work on computers now, right? We don't do anything else. <laughs> and somebody comes in and they need something, and, and instead of like, maybe we could leave a little note on our door, like really busy, kind of agitated, don't come in. <laughs> or, um, but when, when we do that, we're stating our needs really clearly. And this eliminates kind of manipulation and deceit from our personal relationships that we have at home and our work relationships in our broader community. And this also creates are practicing Dharma, a space for other people to hold their needs as well. And then you're creating a safe environment where both, both of you, collectively, everyone, can, can unfold their self and demonstrate their unique individuality. Some of us don't, aren't born knowing what our unique contribution to the world will be. Some of us do know what our contribution to the world will be, and we're going to go like this, and maybe we think that everybody else should be going like this too, and maybe somebody is lying around, um, not doing anything, they're just staring at the flowers, and they're, but then years later they come up with like gorgeous poetry, or they wrote this amazing book that touched our soul, like, oh, we were too busy doing this thing that we knew we had to do. I could not have written that. And so, how do I connect all this with bees? I just ran off. <laughs> Each bee has its dharma that it does. Each bee has its job that it performs inside the hive or outside the hive. And they aren't just working for their individual survival, they're working for their communal survival. And they're also working for the ecological survival. They're pollinating our plants, our fruits, our flowers. If with, without these bees, we would be eating oatmeal, okay? That's it, <laughs> okay? So when you make your purchases at the market, think about that. And you're purchasing organic, 
what am I purchasing? How can I, how can I make this different? How can I practice my dharma to protect the person next to me and protect myself and protect my environment? Because we all are interdependent on one another, just like the bees are interdependent on one another. If a bee spends the night outside by itself, it will die. It has to be in there with the warm hive with everyone else. We want to think that we can be American and individuals and <laughs> live in a little apartment by ourselves and whatever it is we want to do. But we are dependent on one another. And if we keep that in our consciousness every day, that we're dependent on one another, and how am I going to make room for this other person to express themselves while also being respectful of my core needs, I think we can really start to cultivate a feeling of peace and it'll start spreading. Did I miss anything? You are an expert on Dharma, I know. Okay. <laughs> Great, so um, that's the beginning of Dharma. And then I'm supposed to talk about my personal journey and that's a really long story. Because I started, I started seven years ago with Vedika, and um, I was pregnant with my second child. And I, I, my back had been going out since high school, and it had gone out again. And I was bedridden on the couch, and I couldn't take care of my other daughter. And I knew that if I went to the allopathic doctor, I was just going to be given a painkiller. Being pregnant, I thought, well, that's not really something I want to do. Maybe I can't do that. And uh, it's, it's not actively healing. Uh, I would just be covering up a problem, getting through it, but it would still be existing. And so I started looking for Srinyaji and I went for back pain, but I had a huge list of other ailments and, and I think probably all of my Ayurvedic patients are like this. They come for one thing that has like finally gotten to the limit. You know, they can't, can't take it anymore. But then they have, they have this huge list they don't tell you about. <laughs> Sometimes you don't find out for a few weeks. <laughs> you've, just, you've just been focusing, okay, let's get the big picture. But then you have to dig much deeper and oh yes, actually, I am pre-diabetic, and I do have high blood pressure, and I'm, and I'm not happy with my husband, and so you have to work on all these things. So all of these things came up on the table with Shunyaji. I had chronic UTIs, and I had migraines, and a history of anger, and depression, and I think I even beat up a couple of my ex-boyfriends, and <laughs> I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> Um, but, you know, Ayurveda isn't a really, ex it, it, it gets the broad picture and then you start working on the person as a whole and so instead of just getting symptomatic relief, you start working through those things or just dropping the whole story. It doesn't have to be like Western psychology analysis where you go over it and over it and over it for the next 10 years. It's like, let's talk about that. Let's examine a couple of things. Okay, great. You are naturally a healthy person, a whole being, a peaceful being, full of wisdom. That is your true nature. Let's focus on that. And then you do, and it's great. <laughs> okay. So my treatment started really slowly. And it just started with diet changes and approaching old habits in a new way. And um, I had to eat on a schedule, and that was really hard. I had done all these workout programs where you're supposed to eat like six times a day. And then out of that, I was like, well, I'll just snack all day. That would be great. <laughs> I was always struggling with my weight. And um, so then I had to battle all of these cravings as well. And then I really needed to check in with my emotional self every time before I would eat. 
because Shunya Ji had told me not to stuff my emotions down with my food. And for a long time that meant that I would cry like 10 or 15 minutes before eating and it felt really ridiculous. <laughs> but I would just I would just sob over the counter and then I would, and then and I wouldn't try to stop myself, you know how you kind of cry and then you would be like, "All right, that's enough. Uh, you've had enough." And and I had just Okay, let's get it out. And then I would eat my meal, and I was like, oh, this feels really different. And within two weeks of just changing my my food, I, instead of eating tomatoes and pasta every night, I was eating kitchari, which was rice and lentils and ghee and spices. Um, and I was eating on a schedule, and I was eating three meals a day. And just within two weeks, I felt completely different. And my pain even went down, and it was just, just with that little change. And then Shunya Ji told me after a month or so after I started working with her that she was going to start a school and that I should come and study with her, and so I was really surprised. Um, and she compassionately just made space for me to bring my newborn to school and she spent the first year and a half with me at school nursing and um, you know so many of us came that first year and we had Trinity just pulled her clients she said you're going to come and, and study and, and become a, a doctor <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into and um, came with like broken hearts and broken bodies and we were a family and seeking help and if we hadn't spent that first year really focusing on our deepest hurts then we wouldn't be able to lead others towards health the way we do today understanding the science the way that we do today it cannot just be memorized from a book it has to be self-applied Ayurveda is very demanding science. You have to be fully engaged. You have to live it in your daily life. And it doesn't mean you're going to do everything perfect all the time. Um, I've, I've had those ice cream binges and, and that sort of thing. And, um, in Ayurveda, there's the practice of forgiving yourself. <laughs> and not hanging on to guilt because then that creates more of a, a mental explosion and um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy that I'm getting to study Iterate because it gave me so many answers that I knew must be out there but I had no inkling that, that they existed and I'm mostly pain free I didn't boil for a while recently and then I went on a hike for seven miles the Dipsy hike I don't know if any of you are familiar with that and my children made it through like no problem <laughs> and my mom and I were limping down the stairs <laughs> at the end <laughs> because I have two knee injuries and um, and that hadn't happened in many years because I oil every day and just with that warm sesame oil or coconut oil, my knees don't act up, um, takes work. Okay, let's do a beauty mask. <laughs> Who wants to volunteer? I have uh, one brush that I brought, which has been cleaned, and I forgot the other, so You'll either have to endure my fingers, which I will wash, or I have a, um, a cotton swab I can put on your face. I am a little, I don't like people touching my face unless it's my guru. <laughs> All right. So any volunteers? It's an avocado, honey, and cream mask, and it's very moisturizing for the summer heat. And uh, very cooling good for the heart and calming. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. And it can take two if you'd like. It's just, yes, yes, yes. So come and please have a seat. So 
normally this mask is kept on for 15 or 20 minutes, minimum of 10 minutes. And you can keep it on for that duration, um, or you can wash it off with just cold water. Yes, please. Um, so, and then we would love to have your feedback during the cooking demonstration. So then you have some time to wear it if you'd like. Okay. Normally you use your fingers for this part and really you should use your fingers for most of anything because it creates a really beautiful and deep connection with your food and with the ingredients that you're using and I see it as a, a relationship with God which after all is living inside of us.
for someone who is suffering from dry, flaky skin, or just feeling really hot, this would be lovely. And the saffron just also increases the beauty of the skin. Makes you shine, increases your attractiveness. People won't know you're using it, but they'll suddenly want to talk to you. They don't know why they want to talk to you. <laughs> it's because you are putting saffron on your face. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask while we're mixing? Yes? Um, is there like a replacement for avocado that we could use? Um, my mom doesn't get avocado. Ah, hmm. Maheshi. 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 Do you have any idea about this? Okay. I, I think one of our professors has started growing avocado in uh, Pune. Right? I think Abhiji has. So if you can get a seed over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You mentioned that this is not appropriate if there's acne skin conditions. What kinds of options are there available for those? You, you might want to um, just use plain honey. Uh, the, the honey is something that is used for both cleansing and healing wounds. And so, although it has a drying and scraping effect, it's kind of its essence, it also has this very deep and nourishing effect. So it doesn't, it keeps the skin soft. And at the same time, it, it, it eliminates. I've been using it um, and it, it eliminates the it dries it up, it pulls it out, it takes off the dead skin, and it, um, I'm getting distracted, I'm getting all this excited about the honey, um, <laughs> and not mixing. <laughs> but it, it may be a little bit hot in the summer, so I'm trying to think what else what else you can add. The, the You could try adding the milk and the honey, because the milk has extra cooling, but but that's something you would have to see if that aggravated your skin or not because the milk can be a little bit heavy. So try, try the honey and then you can always come back for more information, right? You can try this too. One day of bad breakout isn't going to kill you, you know? <laughs> I have 15 years of acne and I used to walk around with my head down and all sorts of things. And then finally I got a little bit older and a little bit wiser and I was like, God, you know, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Not sure if I want to be involved with someone who is judging me because of my skin. But also, you know, acne is one of the only diseases that that says that past life sin or current life sin is part of the disease. So there's a lot of uh, seva that needs to go into curing your, sin, your skin. So you want to cure your skin, start doing things for other people. It will clean up your mind, clean up your skin, all good things. All right, this is still a little lumpy. Are you open to that? Okay. Thank you. 
do that. I don't let you do that when it's okay with me. <laughs> Shreya apply this and ask these ladies who allow this to sit on their face. Um, it might be a good idea if you felt like it to get up and use, have a little break and use the restroom because we have one more talk from Teresa afterwards. So feel free because we have the one restroom here. Everybody get up, maybe stretch a little bit as she finishes this, and then we'll start the final um, presentation. Actually, it's not the final presentation because they have a recipe demo right after that. Right? No, it is really a wonderful break. You should have a picture. Yeah, I can tell my boss. Can you get a photo to me? Okay, great.